the word of God is alive and active. Amen. And every time you open it, something is imparted into your spirit. Um, three months ago, give or take, um, on Mother's Day, I preached a sermon on a Sunday morning, and I spoke about Benaiah chasing the lion into a pit on a snowy day, and I talked about how we should be fierce and bold in our stance against the enemy. Well, the next two weeks um, in my life got pretty crazy and hectic. I was driving down the interstate, and something came through our windshield, um, left a hole, and glass flew so much so that Katie was sitting in one of the back seats and flew into her mouth. It was one of the craziest things I've ever experienced. And then the following Sunday, um, a man beat on our door to come in, and he had been stabbed. It was the middle of the night. Was it about 1130 or something like that? And um, that turned into a really crazy um, event. And then the following week, something happened that caught me off guard a little bit with a situation, someone that's very close and very dear to me, um, that had to do with me preaching in the church. And that situation kind of rocked me, not just a little bit, but a lot of bit. And the crazy thing is, when you sit in this church for as long as I have, attacks from the enemy should not come as a surprise, y'all. I mean, we've heard it for years and years that when you take a stand against the enemy, the attacks are going to come. But when that happened, it kind of threw me off a little bit, and I did this crazy thing. I opened the door wide open to fear and let doubt begin to creep in about the calling on my life. And I'm going to tell you all something. Fear is a terrorist. And, and much like what's happening in our country, if you begin to look out, you see these groups. They are nothing more than terrorists. They're destroying things, harassing, and trying to steal our freedom. Y'all, that is what we let fear come in and do. We let fear in. We watch it as it begins to destroy things in our spirit and tries to steal our calling and our purpose. In Luke 4.18 in verse 19, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Y'all, what God confirmed in Pastor Billy and me through his spoken word, through words that were spoken over, over us, through dreams of our own, through dreams that were spoken to us, through visions. I was just about to let this terrorist just come in and have it without even putting up a fight. But needless to say, since you know I've, I've preached a few times since then, I woke up to what was going on. And two things that I'm fully convinced of is this, first of all, you can fully rely on the Holy Spirit to never ask you to do something that he's not going to strengthen you, equip you, and anoint you to do. The other thing that I learned is that when God gives you godly spiritual authority in your life, you can lean on that. And my husband is, not only is he my best friend, he is a guard and a spiritual leader. And through this, I just learned that I can lean into him and trust him 100%. Not that I didn't know that, but it's just you learn it more and more the, the longer that you go. And when he gets up here and he says, Pastor Tara, I'm not going to cringe anymore. Because if, if the Lord says to him, we are one and we pastor together, I trust him and I trust the Holy Ghost that he put me here as a pastor with him. And I'm not going to cringe anymore to that. 
And that has nothing to do with my sermon. I'm just making a declaration. <clears throat> so with that being said, I'm going to preach. And something that the Holy Spirit has been working on me about, and I promise you all I'm going get, to get better at this, is that I don't want to have every word and every plan in place when I teach so that I don't say something crazy or get off track and not chase a rabbit and, and not be sure how to get back where we're going. Because if I have this so structured, I don't leave any room for the Holy Ghost, and I don't want to do that. So today I have some notes. I might get off track, but I'm going to give the Holy Ghost some room. Amen? Okay, so we're going to be in Mark. Mark chapter 16. We're going to start in verses 1 through 8. Y'all ready? I just need one amen. <laughs> okay. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, when I started to read Mark 16, and I came across verse 8 in this whole text, I was amazed that the disciples, before Jesus even ascended, that it says that they didn't believe. In the ESV, it says that they were astonished, which means that they were surprised. It caught them off guard, which means maybe they didn't necessarily wholeheartedly believe what Jesus had told them was going to happen. So let's go on to verse 9. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, what does the last part of that verse say? They did not believe. The same unbelief that we saw in verse 8. Okay, let's keep going. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. So later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world." And preach the gospel to every creature. The same unbelief that we saw in verse 8. We see it in verse 11. We see it in 13. And then again in 14. Those four words. They did not believe. But then in verse 15. He's, he tells these people. Who do not believe. To go into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. And he gives them the great commission. And he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you ever read something and, and you're thinking like, what was, could have been going on in Jesus' head at that moment when he knew that these people did not believe? It's like in that moment, I just want to be like, hey, hey, Jesus, like, 
you know they don't believe. Like, how are these people that don't believe going to go out and preach and win the world for you? And I can imagine Jesus being like, shush it, girl. I, I know something that you don't know. And y'all know that's always the way it is with the Lord when you start telling him something. He, he always knows something that you don't know about the situation, you know. And he has a secret that we don't know. So what is that secret? In verse 20, we read it. It says, they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So my question is, when you're reading this text, what happened between verse 14 they did not believe to verse 20 that says they went out and preached everywhere and the Lord was working with them. What in the world happened? Well, chronologically, y'all, when you're reading the Bible sometimes, you know, like you read it and you just think like, oh, well, this happened the next day and this happened the next day and this happened the next day. Well, I'm going to tell y'all, there was a little bit of time from verse 14 to verse 20. Chronologically, the day of Pentecost happened, Acts chapter 2. And then, from verse 19 to verse 20, there was at least 50 days, because that's how long from the time Jesus ascended to when Pentecost happened. So what happened that changed these unbelievers into people who were going out powerfully, fulfilling the Great Commission? Well, let's flip over to Acts chapter 2. Verse 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they appeared to them, divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Y'all, the disciples walked out of weakness. They took a hold of fear. They took it captive, and they arrived at the power to do what Jesus commissioned them to do in Acts 1.8, which says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And in the same way, we can leave our weakness we can leave our fear, and we can step into this unending power through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen? And now Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he also needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit as he embarked upon this mission that, G that, that God the Father gave to him. Now, as John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan, the second baptism happened, right? Amen? Y'all, when I talk about, like, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it just does something like I feel it bubbling up all the way from my toes. So if I get a little excited, go ahead and get excited with me. Ever think about just, I already said this, do you ever think about crazy things when you're reading? Apparently I do all the time. You know, the Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dove. It descended upon the people like a flame of fire. And do you ever wonder, like, why did it happen to Jesus differently than it happened to us? Now, this is just, like, don't, this is not theology or anything like this, but I was just thinking about it. Perhaps the reason that it came on Jesus like a dove was because there is nothing to purify in Jesus. And for us, we have to have the fire because we have to constantly be purified and purged. And that's what the Holy Ghost does in us. Amen? So Jesus is the ultimate pattern for Christians. And he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, and the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they record the same event. But then the fourth Gospel, John, it, it talks about it in a little bit more detail. And if y'all know, that is Pastor's favorite book in the Bible. Um, so John the Baptist declared this in John 132. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. Do you know that the same as it happened for Jesus, when we get full of the Holy Ghost, it's not leaving. And I, I, Pastor Shannon has said this a million times. Nowhere did I read where the Holy Ghost went back up. Still on us, and, it's sti and he's still here. 
Now, Jesus explained it the same way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. He said that in Luke chapter 4. Peter described it like this in Acts 10, 38. He, Peter said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And then John the Baptist said it a different way in 133. He said, he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus had this human experience to show us the experience that we can have. He was the first Holy Ghost baptized man on this earth, and he set the example for us. And, y'all, I love this. John 3, 34. Memorize this verse. It's, it's very short. It says that God gives the Spirit without limit. In ESV, it says that God gives the Spirit without limit measure. You don't, you're not feeling the fire of the Holy Ghost. All you got to do is ask. He gives without limit. He gives without measure, and he wants us to be full. Amen. So first of all, Jesus set the pattern for us to be baptized and full of the Holy Ghost. And then the second thing that he showed us was that he was, um, he was passionate and he was zealous for the things of God. We're going to Flip over to John chapter 2, 13 through 17 says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So to some this temple, this tabernacle, it was a place of worship. But to a lot of people, it was a place of business and how they made their living. But to Jesus, it was his father's house. It was sacred ground, a place of prayer, a place where salvation took place, a place of healing, a place of deliverance for the nations. So he brings out the, the whip for the, the money changers and, and the thieves and and. Man, did he tick off the Pharisees. I mean, they were just filled with rage. And even so much so that his life was probably um, in danger. But the honor of his father and the honor of his father's house being at stake and the deliverance of nations hanging in the balance was so much more important to him than his own life. And, and he just showed so much passion in the way that he honored and loved the house of God and loved his father in such a way. And I want to tell you, in our human experience, our baptism of the Holy Ghost and the fire of God, it translates to us in a form of passion, the type of passion that we saw in Jesus. I mean, he wasn't just passionate with his words. He was passionate in his actions. And, and when Jesus was going to Jerusalem for the last time, we read that, I mean, he knew what was coming. And we read that he walked ahead of the disciples, and they saw how he urged himself on. In, in Mark 10, verse 32, it says, Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid because they knew what was coming. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Why? Because somehow that fire in his soul was evident even in the way that he walked. Amen? So that's in Mark 10. Now, when they arrived at the place where they were going in Mark 11, Jesus saw the desecration of the temple, of his father's house, and, and the disciples began to see this passion played out before their eyes. And they were reminded of the words that we read just a second ago from Psalm 69, 9. that says, for zeal for your house has consumed me. And I'm going to tell you, there is a lot of zeal lacking for the house of the Lord in this country, in this time that we live in. But this anger that Jesus had, it wasn't just born out of fury. It, it, was, it was born out of love. I mean, 
Jesus wasn't just a crazy fanatic. He loved his father, and he loved his father's house, and, and it was his ultimate desire to see people in his father's house worshiping with freedom and peace and joy. But I'm going to tell you what was going on in that time. Commercialism began to consume the house of God. And you don't have to look far to see that in the American church, commercialism is just consuming. Consuming. Y'all, we have, um, we put worship bands up on a pedestal. We put uh, preachers up on a pedestal. We want to be entertained. We want our kids to be entertained. Who has the best of videos? Commercialism is completely consuming the church, just like it was in that day. And in that moment, when Jesus just wanted to see pure worship, the brokenness of his heart began to boil out in a passion. You know, passion doesn't always look like what you think it's going to look like. Now, the fire of the Holy Ghost in his soul made him begin to cleanse the temple. And when I was studying this, I thought about another man who had such a love for the house of God. And, and he was called a man after God's own heart. And that was King David. Let me flip over here real quick to Psalms 26, verse 8. He said, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. And I've said this before, and I know that God is speaking to his church that it is vital and it is important for us to love the house of God if we want to be considered a man or a woman after God's own heart. Amen? So back to the temple. So he cleanses the temple and he makes the Pharisees quite angry. But the children and the blind and the lame stayed. And he healed them. Let me read that to you in Matthew 21, 14 through 16. It says, Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out to the in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Healing and ministering is what Jesus wanted to do. And that was the reason that that passion and that anger began to boil out. And, and he succeeded because it says that the children were just singing and crying out, Hosanna. And I want to tell you that the Holy Ghost and being filled with the Holy Ghost is not distributed by, like, a lottery. It's not just a few people are going to get it, a select few. It's not a game of chance. There's not winners and losers, like, you're going to get a double portion and you're getting nothing. Um, those whom God calls, he fills and he equips. And there is more then enough to go around to God's people, and no one is left out. Amen? The scripture is clear. The baptism in the Holy Ghost is not just for God's favorite, because last time I checked, we're all God's favorite. Amen? On the day of Pentecost, 120 men and women were in the upper room in Jerusalem, and we can read about that, or we did read about that in Acts 2, but I want to read it to you one more time. It says, then, then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it was no coincidence. It was no game of chance for these 120. It says each of the 120 received, and it says all were filled. Their gender, um, their, their age, their race, their status in life did not qualify them for this. It is a gift from God. And it was like someone in heaven had, had counted all the heads since it says that one flame landed on every head. And let me tell you something. If you are in this place and you have a head, 
God has a flame of fire for you. Amen. We are all in that count because Acts 1.8 says, you shall receive power. So imagine your head is a landing strip for the Holy Ghost fire. And when the Holy Ghost fire lands, it's not taking off again. It's staying. You are uniquely created. You are anointed. You are appointed by God for his purpose for this time and for this season. So instead of worrying about what you don't have, instead of me worrying, I don't have a seminary degree or um, I don't know if it's acceptable for women to preach or whatever it is that we don't have to do what we think we need what God has called us to do. Let's focus on what we do have and step out in faith and watch God begin to work through us. On the day of Pentecost, the 120 did not, they didn't cry out for a double anointing. Nobody left the upper room with two flames of fire on their head. It says one, one sat on them. But this one flame that he has for you, and that he has for me. It represents the wholeness of the power and the authority and the glory of God. It represents that in each of us. Amen? In years past, down the road, when we were down the road at the other church, um, when I was a a young teenager, um, the piano player before me, laid hands on me, and God imparted a gift to me supernaturally to play the piano. And when I would give that testimony, people would come up to me and say, "Um, I want you, I want your anointing. Will you pray for me? Sounds kind of weird when I say it now, but I remember seeing people operating in their gifting and they're anointing and thinking, if I could just get them to pray for me so that I could have that anointing. So God would use me the way that he uses them. But here's the truth. You don't want my anointing. You don't want to be a copy of me. And I personally, I don't want to be a copy of somebody else. So we have to quit trying to walk in other people's anointings, other people's gifting, and begin to step out in faith in the things that God has called us to do, created us to do, and do it faithfully and with passion. And if you want to know something about the character of God, think about nature. I read that there's somewhere around seven and a half billion human beings on on planet earth and not one single one of them have the same fingerprint no two leaves on any tree have the same structure why is that that's because god is not in the business of being a duplicator our god is a creator he is in the business of creating things and he only only produces originals. I am an original, you are an original, and we are going to walk out those callings. If we're going to do something for the kingdom of God here, where God has planted us, we got to quit trying to be each other and be what God has called us to do and do it passionately, passionately with the fire of God. Now the flame of fire that is for you, it's so personal that it bears your name. It is custom made to fit you and you only. Nobody on earth can serve God the way that he made you and created you too. You are unique. Your anointing is unique. And that fire that comes with the precious, precious baptism of the Holy Ghost, it changes your status from being ordinary to be an extraordinary. You take on this divine mandate, this assignment, and you can no longer live for yourself. And at that point, when you begin to walk that out, you surrender your fears and your ambitions, and you take on this purpose when you take on that flame of fire. And you become a chosen vessel. 
And, and, and the one example that immediately comes to my mind when I think about this is Moses. Now, think about Moses in the wilderness. He had seen plenty of bushes. He had seen plenty of shrubs when he had been there for 40 years. And I don't think that he went around just checking out the bushes or, or studying um, the shrubs. And if you know anything, if you've ever looked at pictures, the, the bushes in the, out in the wilderness, in the desert, they're, they're not that pretty. They're not fascinating. They're not colorful. They're not blossoming. They're not growing much. They're, they're just not that beautiful. But God took something very ordinary by itself, and he made it extraordinary. It burst into flames that was not consumed. And then he spoke from inside of a burning bush. Y'all, when I read these things, I think we still serve that God. I think that our expectancy sometimes is like, God of the Old Testament, you know, is he's here and well, we're in the New Testament and we're not seeing it. That's because our expectancy is so low. I still serve the God who can catch a bush on fire and it is not consumed. And I'm expecting to see those things. Amen? So Moses, in a way, was like that bush. I mean, he was ordinary and maybe even less than ordinary because he was a fugitive, a murderer, He was hiding from justice, and he didn't have much of a future because he was constantly in hiding. And to top all of that off, I read this scripture today, and it's Genesis 46, 34. I've never, I mean, obviously I've read it before, but it didn't hit me like it did today. It was hitting different today, as Kara would tell me. (laughs) It says, all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. I mean, he was nobody. I'm talking about he was nobody. Body. And Moses saw that burning bush, and it wasn't being consumed. And I don't even know that at that moment, I mean, like, you ever, like, see something, it's like it doesn't hit you, like, right in that moment, what's happening. A couple of years ago, quite a few years ago, we stopped at, we were at the baseball fields in town at Santa Fe, and I got out, and my little girls, let me think about this a minute, Katie was like, how old were you, Katie? Maybe four, so it's been a minute. Um, Kelly was in her car seat, and I'm pretty sure Kara was buckled in, and we got out to talk to um, Billy Joe, and I was standing there away from the car, and I told Katie to go get in her seat. Well, she hopped in the front seat to go through the middle of my van to get to her seat, and when she did, she reached up and grabbed the, what do you call that? The, yeah, the shifter. And in, in my line of view, I began to see the car rolling backwards. But it was like it, it wasn't registering. Y'all, the car, I don't even know if I ever took off running. I was standing there talking to Mitchell. Mitchell kind of stood there like, two. And he finally took off running. Y'all, it went across the road, into the ditch, across the street, perfectly between two cars. It was, it was frightful. But the whole point of my story was that it was like I saw it, but I, it was like it wasn't hitting me what was happening. And that's what I imagine was going on with Moses when he sees this bush, and it's burning, but it's not being consumed. I don't think he was like, this is my life-changing moment. I think he was kind of looking at it like, say what? Like, what's going on? Let's check this out. What's going on here? So, Out of this bush, a divine flame leaps out and transfers into his soul. And Moses, just a man, he became a flame of fire. Because Hebrews 1.7 says that he makes his servants a flame of fire. And on that day, when you turn aside to see the burning bush, whatever that experience is for you, that baptism of the Holy Ghost that changes you from ordinary to extraordinary, I promise you, you can never, never be the same. And you're going to walk through times just like I did a couple of months ago where you step back and you say, Lord, am I in the right place? Am I doing the right thing? Is this the right time? But it's always going to come back. And that anointing and that fire and that passion, when you're walking it out, 
correctly, it's going to be there. It's going to come back. You are going to be passionate and zealous for the things of God and the house of God. And I love what Reinhard Bonnke said. He said, evangelism is a fiery chariot with a burning messenger preaching a blazing gospel on wheels of fire. Allow the Holy Spirit to make your life his chariot. So I pray that every single one of us will have our own burning bush day of Pentecost experience and that we're going to be filled and full of the Holy Ghost so that we can passionately and, and effectively do what he has created us uniquely to do and so that we can also fulfill what the disciples did in Mark 16, 20 when it says that they went out and preached everywhere and the Lord was working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. He makes his ministers a flame of fire. And something that I want to ask you tonight is, do you feel like you have lost your fire? Do you know that God has put a calling on your life and you maybe don't have any passion or direction for that calling that he's put on your life? The only thing that you need is a fresh filling of the Holy Ghost. And 2 Timothy 1.6 says, Fan into flame the gift of God. And I just want to encourage you today that God does not want us to be ordinary. He doesn't want Freedom Fellowship to be like every other church in Silsby. He does not want us to be like every other Christian. He has called every single one of us to be flames of fire and to be extraordinary in our gifting and our calling. In Jesus' name.